Hey, speaking of Hannah and speaking of riding styles, Hayden Deegan, he, um, he's not a uh, perfectionist on a bike, and he reminds me of Ricky in 125s. And I'm not claiming he's going to be Ricky by any means, but he reminds me of, like, I'm going to pin it and try to make this work, and he's got elite fitness. And then he's got a bit of Hannah in riding style and on the podium. Full respect for this kid and sending it and riding like he's doing. What do you see? Do, do you see – Ricky, That's funny. yeah, it's funny you say that because uh, when and we didn't talk before this, no, right? No, we did not. Okay, I completely <laughs> agree. I was going to say he is a combination in my view so far, especially this outdoor season. So far, he is uh, he's Carmichael. Yeah, he goes as however fast as necessary. He'll just go that fast. He'll manufacture some more speed if mm-hmm. it's not enough. Mm-hmm. Oh, I need to make up five seconds. Okay, well then I'll figure that out somehow. And he does. Yeah. And that send it in his words. Yeah. Pass he made. I think it was a restart. Yeah, off the off the off the the same. Yeah, thing. when yep. he went by Levi yep. right there. Yep. I mean, if I'm Levi, I'm like, hey, why didn't you just kind of move your way over to the left and <laughs> cut that line off going to the next left? But it's because Hayden just forced his way in there, and he's like, well, now if I do it, I'm kind of a jerk. and might take us both out. Mm-hmm. And that's a high-speed, sketchy section. And the way Hayden did that was like he's either going to crash huge and get up dead last and have some work to do if his bike isn't bent and he's not hurt, or it's going to work. And it worked. <laughs> and Ricky did that enough times where it worked yeah. that he's like, – remember talking to Chad Watts one time. Um, about Ricky and getting kind of gnarly and on the edge. And he goes, people think this is his edge. That ain't his edge. Yeah, and yeah, so yeah. <laughs> I remembered that statement and it's very much uh, being replayed in what Hayden is doing. Last year, I told some friends of mine, I thought he was going to win. Mm-hmm. And I didn't think he was there to get his feet wet and get used to it and work his way up. I thought he wanted to win right away. And he proved that, you know, that, that was his intention, and he did win a little bit. So the it's not a surprise seeing what I'm seeing now, but when I see him just throwing it out there like he did past Levi in that second moto and catching people from way back in the pack, both motos at Mount Morris, and getting away with some swaps and stuff like Ricky used to, yep. there's, there's that. Then regarding Hannah, um, Hannah was – Nothing against Hayden, but Hannah was pretty mature before he even got into the sport. I think mm-hmm. he was already older than Hayden by then. Yep. And, you know, he was uh, pretty pretty intelligent and pretty mature um, and had been around quite a bit. So he could mouth off and it would be funny and he would back it up. Mm-hmm. With Hayden, hey, you just got here, man. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Put it down a little bit. But I, he's never going to. He's been that way. Yep. That's his DNA. He's going to send it on the podium and on the racetrack and you know sometimes you're like oh gosh i can't believe he said that (laughs) yeah but he's winning and he's not a complete jerk yeah you know i i think he's respectful and if we got to go you know to lunch with him he'd be like yeah he's a really cool kid Mm -hmm. but you know if you're racing against him you're like man i can't i (laughs) i want to beat that guy so bad and just shut him up yeah. But, you know, he's bringing all that to the table, that, that cockiness that mm-hmm. Hannah had. Yeah. And a little bit of the, you know, I don't have a really care a whole lot about my style or what I look like as long as I win. Mm-hmm. And Carmichael was similar. He just was like, well, how fast do I need to go and how good a shape do I need to be in to maintain that pace and even more if I have to? And so he seems to have done that, done all his homework, and his dad was sharp to take him around to a lot of different tracks and places and let him ride with Tomac test with the Yamaha guys and, and really get a head start. And, you know, I, I could look at that. Well, he's had everything handed to him. So did I. <laughs> yeah. Same yeah. exact thing. Yeah. Right. I didn't, you know, that Gary wasn't my real dad. I didn't come out of my mom on 125 or, you know, I had to work for it, but it was a lot of stuff was prepared for me the same way. I can very much relate. And so, but I had to like execute and mm-hmm. make it happen. Yeah. And there's, there's a lot of pressure that comes with that and that's tough to deal with, but if you can deal with it, then 
this is the result you're going to get. I can, ex- you know, speak from experience. It was gnarly. It was a lot handed to me. And I knew that if I didn't do it, it was going to feel really bad yeah. for the rest of my life. Really? And huh? For- you, you did have that feeling, a sense of that? Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah if yeah. I didn't make that happen, then my family, you know, my real dad, Terry Martin, uh-huh. he kind of let me go at a point in time where things were rough and, um, Figured I'd be in good hands, of course, with my mom, and mm-hmm. he knew about Gary some, and he knew that what I liked to do, and he thought, okay, well, for a time, we'll just go ahead and let that ride. And when I got old enough to recognize that sacrifice and how much that Gary, he didn't necessarily need some new kid in his life mm-hmm. and no yeah. privacy and, what well, you know, he didn't ask for that. But um, he saw my desire and my excitement and the thrill of everything, and, and I think he got a kick out of, you know, coaching me along, and I was coachable. But I still had to make it happen. And there were times in 79, 80 at the end of Taco and the beginning of Kawasaki where I had some doubts. And he had a couple of good chats with me, not on my case, but yeah, going, yeah. look, yep. it's all right there. Don't worry about beating that guy and that guy and you're clear back here. That guy's about ready to retire, and so is that guy and that guy. You just keep doing what you're doing and improving, and you're going to be up there at the top pretty soon, and you'll be equipped a little bit better to be able to hang there and feel like that's where you belong. And it worked. Mm -hmm. And so I think Brian has done a good job with Hayden in in a similar way, And but Hayden still had to do it. Oh, yeah. for and, that, I'm, I'm real impressed. You know, yeah, you can hand a, somebody a lot of stuff, but all that is is potential. Dude, look at his fitness. He, that, that, right? doesn't, that doesn't get given to you. That's work. Potential. <laughs> I heard Bill Parcells, I think, uh, football coach, say potential is nothing. Execution is everything. Oh, yeah. And that's what Hayden's doing. And, you know, I got to just applaud him. Uh, absolutely. Going into the uh, into TV coverage a little bit, um, James has been back, and you know I think he had some difficulties with the way his career ended, and I think he, he didn't want to be around a little bit. Was a little bitter. Um, you know, we've talked a few times of him and I, and but it's great to have him back in the sport. You were you called a lot of his races. I don't know how many interactions you actually had with him when you were in the booth. Um, I think he does a great job. I'm very surprised how all in he is. Uh, but we're better off for it. What do you, and obviously why again, I mean, we can just make fun of Weege if you want, but um, <laughs> what, what what's your take on, on James? I think he does a good job. Yep. And, you know, he, he has fun with it enough that if there's any little hiccup here or there, it doesn't matter. He mm-hmm. can, he can pull that off, you know, and um, you can tell that he really loves it and he really wants to explain it and mm-hmm. teach and, educate the viewers and have fun and keep it light plus you know if he has anything real serious to say you're like well yeah this guy knows (laughs) right so i'm i'm listening you lean forward a little bit i want to make sure turn it up turn i want to hear this yeah so that's a good thing to have as a color analyst you know he stays in that lane he lets jason do the play-by-play because it's real important to you know the play-by-play guy to do that and not you know, speculate on the riding styles and all that and let the expert color and analyst do that part. And they're mm-hmm. doing a good job of doing what it is in their role. And it makes it fun to watch. Um, you know, I, I don't have anything to say, you know, negative about other guys, but I think sometimes you put people in a position they're not comfortable in. They tried to put me down on the floor and do a lot of stand up type stuff. Mm-hmm. I was horrible at that. Oh, my gosh. I was just like, please don't put me in that position or it's going to ruin everything else I say. <laughs> so, you know, let me be in the role with that, that I'm good at. Yeah. And um, I thought that when they first started out with Ricky down the floor, he was fantastic. And whatever, it just didn't, somehow didn't transfer to the booth. Mm-hmm. Um, but Ricky's very smart. He knows exactly what he's talking about. And again, you go to lunch with him or something and you learn a lot. Yep. He's awesome. But, um, I, get, I think James is a little bit more comfortable up there or something. And it comes across. I've told Ricky, you know, like, Hey man, you're the goat. You can, you can be a little more honest with us and a little more opinionated 
And we will just, like you said, we'll just shake our heads and lean in and be like, yep, okay. I think Ricky's a little still a little worried about hurting feelings and, you know, doing that. And that's, hey, listen, you are what you are as a human being, as a person, and he doesn't want to go there. But, David, we, we do this podcast called The Reraceables. You've been on it, I think, before, where we watch old races, myself, Wygan, and Seth Rarick, and then we watch old races, talk about them, laugh at some of the things that go on and compared to today's, and, and then we get somebody involved in the race to call in and tell us a little bit about it. And obviously, we've been watching a lot of you and Art, and – uh, you you were not scared. I don't – at the time, watching you, I was more of a mechanic then. Maybe I wasn't as involved or whatever. I don't remember thinking back then how blunt you were, but upon rewatching, yeah, David, you, you were not scared to throw it out and, and throw out an no, opinion. No, it was yeah. ready, fire, aim. And then I'd think about it later and be like, wow, I'd be on the plane ride home going – I think that guy's going to be mad at me. <laughs> but it was know, fine. I don't, I don't, yeah. That's not what I meant, though. Right. You know, but you don't have time to re-explain that and stuff. Mm-hmm. And it, it's it's not like tennis, you know, where they serve it and the guy, they hit it back and forth a couple times and it's over. And then while they're between points, you can show this angle and that angle and that angle. And whoever's commentating has a lot of time to explain it. Mm-hmm. In Supercross, especially, and then Motocross, man, you don't have any time. It's going. You're on the clock, and if you miss and can't spit it out, it's too late. Yeah. And you, there could be times as a, an analyst, and I'm sure Ricky and James and Grant and Langston and all that, they've all experienced this where there's something you really want to talk about, and you're like, God, you just want to dump the clutch and start <laughs> talking. And, you know, they're throwing it down to somebody downstairs or over there. And the other, the other guy's talking about, hey, in the next week's race, is it be sure to look. You know, it's like, yeah, yeah. no, right now I need to talk. Yeah. And then when it is your turn, there's nothing much to talk about. You got to kind of fill. Uh-huh. It's really difficult. And I've fortunately had a really good start with Dave Despain and Art Ekman. And then, you know, I was fortunate enough to – to just kind of get tossed in and, and have that kind of experience right off the bat to guide me mm-hmm. and to explain like, Hey, you know that thing? You're, that's great. More of that. And that, no, 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 don't, you know, yep. don't be doing that too much because that you're going to lose people and this and that. And so they gave me good direction. And then I got to work with like, Paul Page and Bob Varsha and Terry Gannon and Todd Harris and a bunch. And so I had a lot to pull from to learn how to deliver that. And I don't think I really even did very good at it until like almost 2000 and somewhere in there. I felt like, man, it's starting to fire on all cylinders where I'm comfortable in this role. I always hated the on-camera stuff, nervous. But, man, if you got a race going on in front of me and you're asking me to my opinion in places and I got a little room to talk. I have no problem with that. And with James, the interaction that we had, remember one time Davey Coombs was like, Hey, let's have a contest. We're in the Kawasaki pits. Okay. It was Anaheim or something. And he goes, Hey, like a trivia thing, you know? And he's throwing out these questions and then he, I think he turned it over to James and James is just putting me on the spot. Like, okay, who won this? second moto at Bud's Creek in 1997 or four. And I'm like, I don't have no idea. I, I don't know. I can't remember that. I, I kind of wasn't paying attention to it around the times he was asking me yeah, either. Yeah. So yeah. I have that as an excuse, but he knows, I mean, if there was a trivial pursuit motocross thing, man, he would smoke everybody. So that is important mm-hmm. to have that love for the sport, for the sport's history and how it's evolved, and when you have that position to sit there and deliver it to to fans and new fans potentially, I think he embraces that responsibility and he has fun doing it, and it comes across. What was the uh, biggest kerfuffle you caused with a rider? Do you does one stand out for you on things that you said or something you said or a mistake you made or anything like that? Um, a guy being bummed to me. I mean? Yeah, yeah. Oh, um, I don't think LaRocco was too pumped with me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I don't think Greg Albertine was, too, I called him and apologized one time. Oh, you did? Um, yeah. And, um, now those are the two that I can think that, you know, they weren't, they weren't stoked on me. I'm yep. sure there was a bunch of others, you know, but I've actually heard from some guys 
Emig was one. Uh-huh. Um, years and years later, they were like, you know, I wasn't really too big of a fan of you when you're in the booth, man. But you're right. <laughs> kind of that kind of a thing. When yep, I was like, yep, hey, yep. you didn't have to come find me to say that, but you know, thank you, I appreciate it, and I, I didn't want to bum you out. I just want to make sure that I'm being honest. And I'm consistently honest so that people will believe me. And yeah. then what, whatever I say in the future, you're not going to be like, well, I don't know. He said that one thing. I think he's full of it. <laughs> I wanted to be honest. Yeah. And sometimes that hurt a little bit uh, to guys. And, and believe me, I felt it. Like, how am I going to – I don't have that guy's phone number. How, can, how am I going to apologize? I try to make it up to him later. Oh, there was a guy from Australia. I think there was Brothers. And he was fast, really fast. And um, I can't think of his name. Okay. And I said something about him at Steel City. And he was not stoked at all. <laughs> he was really kind of bummed. And I told him, I'll make it up to you. And then there was some big presentation thing at Oakley headquarters one time. And they're sitting in that big amphitheater. And mm-hmm. I, I made it it up to him right there like i i didn't like to bum guys out that wasn't my motive it was to be honest yep and for core fans to go like okay i i, I believe him so i'm gonna listen i'm a, i might not agree but yeah he's making an interesting point we'll see how that plays out and that's something that art taught me he goes you know if if you can make a prediction and tell us what you think is going to happen and stay ahead of us don't worry if it if you're not right you, sometimes you might, you know, miss it and mm-hmm. you're not right, but that's okay because you're not afraid to jump out there and, and say something. And that gets people to tune in a little bit. And, uh, you know, I just had real good direction right off the bat. And I think uh, James is a really good student of things and of the sport, obviously. And so yeah. he's picked that up without maybe having all the direction that I did. Yeah, yeah, I think I think you're right, and and the and passion shows, right? Yeah, I think it really does show. Yes. Um, speaking of art, we uh, we lost Art Ekman a little while back. Uh, your partner for a long time. Um, really funny to to read the uh, obits of of his history and how he wasn't really a motocross guy, and then fell into the sport, and then you know became to love it, and really like, you know, when you scroll through Instagram, David, I don't know how much you do that, but there's so much of you and Art. And being like, this is the best era of the sport, and it was you two bringing it, you know, bringing the voices and Davey down in the pits, and so yeah, uh, a little bit about Art, if you don't mind. Yeah, that was a really good team with uh, Art and I and Davey, and I think Davey in the very beginning, the same thing as I had, like with the stand-up stuff, having to memorize thing. But he, he, um, I think we were already jiving pretty good and Davey eventually you know Mm -hmm. not eventually it didn't take too long but it wasn't coming natural and eventually we just all made each other better and art was at the helm i didn't realize at the time how much experience and how many sports and how many major you know interviewing mickey mantle and doing boxing and san diego rockets before they moved to houston I mean, he did everything. Mm-hmm. I think if I would have known that at the time, it might have made me a little nervous. <laughs> but I, I didn't know all that. And so I, you know, I, hopefully it wasn't in a condescending way, but I was like, I'm the one that kind of knows what's going on here. So you do your thing and mm-hmm. then just trust me and I'm going to do mine. And he was very respectful to just let me go and go. And every once in a while, he'd just put up a finger like, hey, 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 you know. <laughs> <laughs> and you know at times i'm like you're talking too much i got i got you know i wanted to just get in there and say stuff but yeah um he was really good at knowing how to get people excited and you know that he's told me he goes don't i know they want you to have more energy they're going to mm-hmm. tell you and i have a very low monotone voice and even no stomach muscles of course that doesn't help <laughs> yeah but i was kind of low yeah and they're always like hey come on more energy more energy and i'm like an art you kind of, you know, took me aside. Like, yeah, I know they're telling you all that. Okay. But, but look, you be you and talk at that voice. And then when something does happen, you bring it up. Yeah. And that's what he would do also, except with the voice of like God. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he, had, he had some pipes, man. Oh yeah. He had uh he'd call me sometimes early in the morning when your voice is kind of 
horse and, yep. you know, not yep. like all cleaned out yet. And man, it was the deepest, most incredible sounding voice. Like, Hey partner, you want to make breakfast here at about 15? Yeah. And it was like unbelievable, the voice. And he knew exactly how to use it. Yeah. He had a funny story about everything and he's 20 years ahead of me. Yeah. So I always looked at him as like the beacon of, you know, this is what can be done. This is how much you can go and look and research and, and learn and visit and, and, uh, experience life. You know, I, I got got 20 more years ahead of me at least where I, man, look at all that there is out there because we didn't go to a city that he didn't have mapped out and figured out (laughs) the best food and the best band and the best place to go to look and take a photo. Yeah. He was really, really fun to be around and really good at, um, bringing out the best in me and occasionally give me a little talking to in the rental car on the way to the track going partner. I know you're going to want to, you know, go off about this, but I think you need to maybe hold back. On oh, that. really? Huh? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh yeah. Yeah. A couple, <laughs> couple TV meetings too, where I was getting kind of grouchy towards the end. And he'd be like, like me hey, partner. Uh, okay. If you got a complaint, um, you better have a solution or a, or a good idea. Yep. Otherwise, I don't care how good of an idea in a, or a complaint you have. If you don't have some sort of a solution or a fix, mm-hmm. then just zip it, you know. And, man, okay. And I remember that, you know, to this day. Like, don't just talk when you're mad and don't just spout off about what you don't like. Uh-huh. Have a, a reason and a fix. Otherwise, just, you know, be quiet. Interesting. Um, I looked at him almost like a dad. Yeah. He was... You know, I was really fortunate to have been become, you know, a, a team with him, but also um, to learn so much from him on a on a whole different level. You know, where we hung out a little bit was the the World Supercrosses we did in Switzerland and Arnhem. Remember, Yamaha was like the only team that did them, and you guys were over there. And, yeah, uh, and he hung out a lot. Art did around that around us and and. Had a few drinks at some couple hotel bars with him, and yeah, yeah, really, really need to talk to him, you know. Every once in a while, man, he would just go into like kind of the anchor man thing a little bit, <laughs> right? Yeah, for and sure. It was just hilarious, and and he would hold court, and yeah. he'd have. I'd come in sometimes from you know whatever it was I was doing, and I'd look over in the you know the bar in the yeah. lobby little yeah. restaurant thing and man there'd be a big group big group of people over there laughing like, what's going on oh it's art it's art yeah 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 um i miss him i got to his wife donna um set up a trip for him to come out and visit some family and stuff and we we made time to get together at a really nice restaurant in anaheim hills oh nice and when he drove away well actually when i drove away and watched him walk back into the hotel with donna i cried i was like, yeah um yeah it was tough i thought i might not see him again and i didn't yeah wow yeah you guys were great um and yeah like you know i don't think people realize the hours that you know you and him would have spent together uh, you know it's not just get together and call the race it's, it's a lot a lot yeah yep. Yep. Uh, he came to the iron man in 98 and watched me and you know investigated that whole entire island and knew everything <laughs> he had notes and he, he oh, made really? it oh, wow. cool he took a bunch of pictures and he made me a little uh special scrapbook that had like my kids and my wife and my friend todd who helped me train for it and yeah. and um did a helicopter ride and he did everything he could do on the big island that i never made time to do because i was just there to race yeah Wow. Um, so it's neat to look back on that and see his perspective because he would write something really special under the photos. He had a certain cool handwriting. And, yeah. Yeah, man, a special guy. And, yeah. and, um, yeah, and I'm glad that we all got to be around him some. 